And I'd like to get us going with a prayer for tonight, if you would all, in your own way, just participate with me as we start tonight's prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the rest of this day, our daily bread, whatever we might need. Forgive us our trespasses and our debts as we look back through the day and forgive those who may have trespassed against us. Um, throughout the rest of the evening, lead us not into temptation, but certainly we ask you to, to deliver us from the evil one. We know that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, not just yesterday, but today and forever and forever and forever. And we just praise your name tonight as we get started. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. And welcome to Dare. I see Dare's popped in here. Um, so as we start tonight, I would like to, we had two people that uh, did the optional. If you have a syllabus, I've posted on there every week, kind of an optional exercise that is not necessary for you to do, but it's just always an extra thing for you to do if you want to practice like various ways to know God better. Uh, the whole idea there is that um, those are not counting for a grade, but they do give you a chance to interact differently than what maybe you'll do through the main spiritual practices. And so again, those are optional, but um, if you do if you do participate in those and you share them with me, I'll probably ask you to bring them to class with you to share as well. And tonight, last week, we talked about the 23rd Psalm, which I hope is rich, rich for you. I hope it was helpful for you. I hope you were blessed by that reading of the Psalm in a new way. Uh, and so what, I, what the spiritual practice was, uh, the optional spiritual practice was to take that Psalm and kind of take it, write it in your own words. Basically, you could expand upon it, you could shorten it, you could remix it, you know, kind of however you wanted to line by line. And so we had two people send those in and Pat was one of them. So I'm going to ask Pat, if she will, to uh, share with us her writing of the 23rd Psalm. I found this to be very beautiful. Um, it's just a real good personal heartbeat kind of a summary of 23rd Psalm for Pat. So Pat, whenever you're ready, if you would unmute and share that with us, I would love for us to hear that together as a class. All right. Psalms 23. The Lord is my protector, and I am not afraid when I go to bed at night. I can rest knowing that he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. I am not afraid. He prepares the table before me, and I want for nothing. My enemies stand back because he is my protector. He leadeth me besides the still waters, restores my soul in the path of righteousness. And whenever I walk through troubles, no matter how deep, no matter how far, he's with me. He is leading and guiding me everywhere I go. The Lord is my shepherd, and I do not want. Amen. Amen. That was so good. Uh, when you read it, it's so perfect because it's coming right from your heart. I love the phrase when you said, my enemies stand back. <laughs> I love that. Yes. That's yes. so cool. Yeah. <laughs> your voice, I mean, everything in you just kind of came out on that one. I really loved it. So thank you so much for sharing that. It's a powerful way to, you know, uh, take a scripture and really get familiar with it. Sometimes it helps God reveal things to us when we take a scripture and do that. And so you can do that anytime with any passage and uh, just give yourself space to work with the Holy Spirit on that. And uh, so thank you for sharing. I'm going to ask Dare, if he will, to do the same. I don't know if Dare brought his copy of what he did with his psalm, with the psalm there for him, for his word work there. Um and so it was a translation by Robert Alter, but uh, I wanted to see if Dare would be willing to read that for us. Are you prepared to do that, Dare, for us? You'll have to unmute if you are able to share. Get this unmuted. Okay. Um. Uh... 
I just followed his translation with my reflections. Um, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want is the way he translated it. Yahweh, my creator, really is actively, effectively my provider of everything I need, spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially, vocationally, politically, my secure relationship with him, relationship with all my friends, all the supporters and encouragers, any work to which he calls me, any task to which he gives me. And that, of course, means I'm his sheep. As dumb and defenseless as they, and as easily and often going astray like they. In green pastures, he makes me lie down. By quiet waters, he leads me. Providentially, he guides into the best places for me and provides all the provisions I need in choice quality and quantity. Sometimes, even when I've strayed, he still provides. Unfortunately, I must always follow and don't. I must consume what he provides and don't. And too often, choose food he doesn't provide. My life he brings back uh, with translation I disagree with because life I think is too narrow a translation there. He brings me back. It's me, the whole me to fellowship with himself and to who and to what he has cre created me to be holistically uh, spelled with a whole. Uh, W-H-O-L-E. He leads me on paths of justice for his namesake. And again, I disagree. Justice is too narrow. He leads me in the ways of his righteousness that saves me and leads to victory. He leads me in upright paths of morality and piety. He leads me in lifestyle service to others that reflects his rescuing righteousness that I started with. Everything he does is for his glory and to exalt his son, Jesus. It's not about me or my reputation. Though I walk in the veil of death's shadow, I fear no harm for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, it is they that console me. Even when in the greatest difficulty or deepest despair, he's with me, suffering with me as well as sustaining me, especially when facing real death itself in closest family or in myself. Even when I was there because I strayed, he's with me. I wish I had the psalmist quite confidence all the time that he has all the resources and skills to protect me. You set out a table before me in the face of my foes. You moisten my head with oil, my cup overflows. You constantly challenge me with competitors and complainers and those who disagree with me but you always refresh and encourage me abundantly and help me to be civil and accepting. Let but goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life. Your love and loyalty, compassion and mercy, goodness and generosity fill every day, pervade every experience, especially when I feel their need and when I feel awkward even about them. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord many long days. That's your promise and my hope every day now and for the future. May I remember that in every circumstance, 
internalize it and reflect it in my instincts and reactions. Thank you. That was also beautiful. I noticed you're so good at using words that give all possibility to God effectively, um, everything, all, any, um, best, all, you know, everything, all you just, I just circled them as you went down through constantly, always abundantly pervade every. And so your Psalm is replete with the, you know, as far Part of the edges as you can go at giving God credit and glory and uh, making him, you know, as big as he can be. So that was one thing that stood out to me. I also loved your uh, phrase, his rescuing righteousness. I like that phrase a lot among others, but, uh, and then you're, you were very real with how you feel sometimes about the Lord shepherding you. And it's a bit uncomfortable, but you, you, you still accept it. Right. So those were some really neat things about it. But again, you can all do this anytime with any passage. Again, it gives you a chance to expand your own way of sharing back to God, of praying, of using the scripture as a prayer. It can even enlighten you to some things. It can make you look up a word that you don't understand. It can can really expand your, your trust in and love for the scripture. So that's just something as a bonus that you can do uh, whenever you want to. And I want to thank those those two share outs today. That was really nice. Really nice for us to be able to do. Um, going to try to share if I can. I'm not even sure what's happening here, but. Um, Welcome to the world of technology. Yeah, this is a new computer and I didn't test the um, <laughs> share out button. Uh oh. <laughs> now, we're, now we're going to uh, do a setting real quick here. Uh, if you guys can give me just one minute here. I finally figured that out on mine. I couldn't get the audio to work right. And maybe, um, maybe it'll work now. Here we go. Thanks for your patience. Oh, we got it. I'm going to get rid of this, I think, right here. All right, so this time we are going to go into the actual spiritual practices. We're going to be sharing those together today. Uh, and um, without too much review today, as I want to use the time to to talk about those psalms. Also, you, ha you should have a downloaded note page. And it, there's only a couple of blanks on there today. So I didn't, you know, I'm not trying to make it too overwhelming. All I want to know is that you're, going through it and filling it out. So all of you on this call right now have done an excellent job at keeping up with that. So thank you for being great students in that way and helping yourselves to grow. Uh, but for review, I just want to rem remind us last time that we kind of talked about this triangle cycle of sufficiency. I don't know what it's kind of, I don't know what I call it an ethic of agape love is what I call it actually, but it's just the the pattern here of uh, learning through like the psalmist did to trust God. And as he did that trust, he had to die to himself and his own will of where he wanted to go, where he thought might be the best place to be led um, at certain times and places. And then as he allowed himself to die out of that trust, then he could experience and walk in all the days of his life, um, the love of God and dwell in the house of God. And that's kind of a, a simple way to show that. So we talked about that last week. Um, I'm going to uh, bring it back up in just a minute. But I just want to remind you, as you practice these disciplines, and as you come to know God more joyously, you will come to trust in the strong reality that access to life in the kingdom of heaven means this one thing, that we are not missing out on anything. And when you can get that, when you know and you come to a joyous understanding that it's a strong reality, the strongest reality, in fact, that the kingdom of heaven, we are not missing out on anything, that we're headed toward everything. So that means anything you miss right now that you think you're not getting, God is bringing you toward everything. And so there's no fear of missing out. Um, and despite your surroundings and distractions and shame and 
tendency for your body to hold condemnation in your shoulders and your and your body, your and the fear it holds sometimes. We have this good shepherd who's always with us, who's always attentive to us, and he's leading us toward everything. So once you come, I think through the disciplines, you're going to come to know the strong reality that the kingdom of heaven is here for you and you're not missing out on anything. And that's really the point of all of this is to know God well enough that we actually believe about him what we say we believe about him. And that's just a, a growth process for all Christians. So our framework basically is we know we want to be transformed because discipleship following Jesus involves transformation. He said, come follow me and I will make you, I will transform you into fishers of men, fishers of people, people who impact others for the kingdom of God, who make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so his kingdom is available to us. We can enter it at any moment as we seek transformation. And there are obstacles to that kingdom that we that we talked about. We'll bring those back out tonight. But the grace that he gives us is available as fuel so that once it takes care of our sins, it also gives us power, personal power to live beyond condemnation, past the obstacles. And then it allows us to access that trust, that death to self, and the action of agape love. So um, this is a new picture for you tonight. It's another triangle. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be stuck on these things, but they just give you a, a way to see something. So it just helps you to see it if you like it. If you don't, it's okay. No, no big deal. I'm not going to make you memorize this uh, triangle. But when we look at this uh, this tr first triangle, we want to know how do we get to where we can trust? I think that's the key is once you ha have a firm confidence in the weight of what the kingdom of God does, once you have strong confidence that you're not missing out, then you can follow this pat this this kind of cycle here of death to self and agape love. But until you trust, until you believe enough about it, you're going to have trouble dying to self. Most people are wanting are seeking comfort. Um, most many people are you know seeking to uh, be upwardly mobile, which is not necessarily a bad thing for sure. But um, it's, we're trying to kind of run away from this death to self. Um, and that's got us in a lot of trouble, you know, to try to build our churches in such a way that they just meet everybody's wants and needs in a consumeristic way has caused us to lose this power right here of death to self. And so our trust in God, I think, has waned some over the last number of decades with some of the things we've tried to do with seeker sensitive churches and things like that. And that's not really a critique. It's just saying our death to self is low, which means our trust in God, you know, to really have a strong confidence in God and us not missing out on anything. We, we've kind of traded that in. And I want to, I want us to to consider that, you know, bringing that back because that's the power of the gospel. No matter what happens to us, that death to self will be critical in us showing agape love to the world, which is our mission to show agape love to the world. Um, Agape love is not sappy, by the way. It's not uh, necessarily always sweet or permissive. You know, it doesn't always give permission. It's it's very confrontive, actually. Um, agape love has us will the good of God and will the good of the other. And if we're willing for the good of the other, that means we we feel okay about ourselves. We don't feel like we're lacking out anything. So if we if we have to if we want to will the good of someone else, we have to literally die to self and we have to trust God enough to do that. And so agape love is a very powerful, powerful tool, the most powerful tool in the entire world. And that's why we're so in love with Jesus, because that's exactly what he showed us, you know, in his life. So here, here we go. What I've been talking about and what we're going to continue to talk about is we have these disciplines right here and we plan to, to use them so that we can be made new. But how do we use them? Well, we use them in the ordinary events of life. So today, you know, when I was, when I had ordinary life struggles, challenges, or temptations, um, I should have, you know, kind of a, a way in my calendar to practice putting on a new heart every day so that as I face these things, these temptations, the actions of the Holy Spirit are making me new. They're They're actually helping me put on a new heart. So my plan is, as these things happen, and they will happen in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. And here's how you remember that I've overcome the world. You stay close to me. And there's many ways to do that. 
So again, this is just another another uh, piece of uh, that might help you to see what we're doing as we begin to talk about the disciplines. We're just putting them on here. We're, we're practicing these disciplines so that when the ordinary events of life and the temptations come, we're not just with our feelings. You know, we're not just left to our feelings, or we're not just left to the pressures of the people around us, or we're not just left to what the government's doing, or we're not just left to what you know um, our, our our boss is doing. We literally can can walk in these disciplines, and as these things come our way, the Holy Spirit comes in and he helps us to face these things with grace and to actually respond to them in agape love every time. Um, and I know that, you know, again, that may seem like something that it isn't really possible right now, but, you know, again, as you grow in this grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness, that um, teaches us to, in the face of um, you know, an assault or a, not an assault physically, but like a, you know, a slanderous moment or something to, you know, die to self and take an action of agape love. It, it disarms all of those things. It, it brings fruit where there was death, you know, and light where there was darkness. And so it's a very powerful idea. And these disciplines uh, are, are the way to um, help us to face these temptations of life and actions of the Holy Spirit, get involved in what we're doing. And then once we do that, our trust grows, we can die to self and we can, um, you know, we can live in agape love. So again, I'm not quizzing you on the triangles. You may not even like the triangles, but I do think it helps me to teach a little bit about what we're, we're getting ready to do. So uh, this, you can go back and watch this more if you want to, or you can privately reach out to me if you want more talk about this. Like if you want to apply your life to it, uh, for instance, we're not going to take the time in class to do that, but if you want to privately do that, I'd be happy to spend a few minutes with you just walking through some daily temptations or circumstances and then walking through some of these uh, ideas with you. But I want to get us to the practices today. And so we're going to we're going to launch into that for most of our time uh, here. Um, we have uh, some guidance to give you before we get to those. Um, so I'm just going to read down through this, kind of boring, but uh, I want to make sure I say these things um, at least once to you as we go through go through this uh, part of the class. So in the life from above, which is, you know, you remember the story of Nicodemus when Jesus says, unless you're born from above, you know, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so in the life from above, as we're, access, as we're accessing the kingdom now, um, the use of disciplines is not for the correction of specific problems. So we're not using these to fix everything, okay? But what we're using them for is transformation of our inward self. Now, that that transformation may fix some of our problems, and it probably will. But we're not using these as a, as a tool to, to fix life. We're using them as a tool to be changed inwardly so that the deeds of Christ will flow from who we have become in him. Um, so it's not about a one case problem that we're fixing. It's about who we're becoming as we face everything, because, you know, we're headed toward everything and, and we're headed toward eternal life, which is who we, we want to become the kind of people that will always be when we, when we arrive there, right? We're, we're moving toward that. We really are in the kingdom and we want to be, become the ki kind of kingdom people that Jesus created us to be. So second bullet point, what has to be transformed is the enduring inner state. So the, that eternal state uh, that we're going to be engaging with life forever and ever as we are benevol benevolently ruling with him um, in the kingdom of heaven. So through grace and discipline habits, change, um, through grace and discipline, habits change that live throughout our mind, our soul, our body, our social context from which we immediately speak and act. I, I think that's a fundamental shift in the modern church. Yeah. That yeah. that much of our, uh, especially modern life-oriented preaching, uh, it deals with all these peripherals and not the heart. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, there's depth, you know, the depth of inward transformation will, all the presenting issues are attached to a, just a deeper knowledge of Jesus Christ and this resurrected life. And in Colossians 3, Paul really, really sets that up. And he says to set your heart and mind on things above because you died and your life is hidden with Christ. If you can accept that reality deeply, then you can put put to death sexual immorality, impurity, evil desires, and greed. You know, Then you can set aside anger, rage, malice, slander. Those presenting issues and the troubles that we have are really tied to a that strong belief, I think I said earlier, that strong belief in the fact that we are not missing out. And if we can, through the disciplines, have that inner transformation and have, have that as our core reality, then we, we it really will make a difference in, in our lives. And so I appreciate your point there. It's very true. We don't want to, we don't want to attack necessarily the external, the external thing, the need or the presenting issue. We want to, we want to go inwardly with Christ and let him transform us from the inside. Uh, we really are going to become different. Um, I have been become a totally different person in the last couple of years, few years. Not not on the outside. Many people might see me and say, well, I notice your confidence may be better, Brooke, but I don't notice anything behaviorally. But I can tell you my anxiety is way different. My trust in God is way different. My um, ability to trust grace and act in agape love is much better than it used to be. Uh, and so there's much transformation. So we will be, go, we will become different, but not by repression or pushing things down, but we will become different by transformation. It, it will happen. It doesn't happen by infusion or information, though those are important. It only happens by action. Only action produces character and shapes the will. So that's why we want to practice these things because that's our actionable piece. If we take action, our character surely changes. Um, disciplines are for disciples. They're not for self-improvement. They are self-validating in practice, not in talk. So they have to be put to practice. They are not deeds and righteousness, but they are works of wisdom. They don't make you attain righteousness, but they work in you wisdom so that you live out the righteousness that comes from God. And then here's a really important one, and this is on your notes, page number one, your first blank on your notes. You never, but never want to be a hero in the disciplines. And <laughs> we're not, you know, that goes back to the old, uh, here's what I did. Look at look at how many disciplines I'm doing, you know. Look how many times I've fasted, you know. I, I prayed 27 days in a row, you know. <laughs> you know, we don't ever want to be a hero in the disciplines because God is the hero, Um we're actually doing this for a knowledge of him to know him better. So that's one of your blanks there. Um, never, but never be a hero. I guess that's the second blank. And the first blank is only action produces character. It's right there. I had it, I had it in italics, but I forgot. So only action produces character and shapes the will. All right. A couple more. Utilize, we utilize a range of disciplines and including those who keep us in touch with more experienced Christians and then the general fellowship of believers. So you don't want to, I mean, you might do one already. Like you might want to do one of these disciplines already. You may have, be a great prayer and you may say, I have to pray every day. It's just what I do. Or you may study the Bible a lot, or you may, you know, you may pick up on some of these and say, this is me. I do this already. But what I want to help you do is ask God what he wants to do. What would he invite you into that would grow you? What would he invite you that would deepen and strengthen your resolve about who he is? So we're listening for God to invite us into new disciplines that we may not be already doing. But one thing I will say is this, a lot of Christians do spiritual practices, but they don't. some people don't even recognize that they're doing them. So we definitely want to make sure that you're encouraged if you are doing one and say, yes, keep, keep it up. If it really is giving you what you, if it really is strengthening your confidence in God. Um, but it may be that God's inviting you to a different one. So we want to make sure we're always asking God what he wants to do so that because he knows us better than we know ourselves. Yours is a personal walk with your Savior and teacher, so listen to him. And then in a wise life of discipline, you will certainly receive the abundance of life and rest of soul, which are a natural part of that eternal life. Okay? So, with all those guidance points, uh, I'm going to start uh, talking about 
these for about 30 minutes if we can or, or 20 minutes. And I'm just going to list the ones here. Um, the first set that we're going to look at, these are called disciplines of abstinence. And that's, you know, just a way to categorize them. You know, if you just try to remember them all, it's kind of tricky. So if you put them in a, uh, two categories, then you can, when you hear one, you can say, oh, that's definitely an abstinence one. Abstaining from something or sacrificing something, you know, giving up something is abstinence there. Um, I want to look at Second Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2.11. Um, that little C there on my notes in the parentheses means uh, commit, commission. There's sin, we, we commit sins and we omit. We can sin by omission. We can sin by co committing a sin, right? Commission, commission. Um, and these are disciplines that if you're committing a sin or temptation is getting you a lot, then some of these practices will help you to, um, you know, kind of become happy and joyous without getting everything that you want. Like they'll start to dispel some of your desire, basically. And so uh, in 1 Peter 2.11, I've got my Bible here. Uh, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul, right? So we don't want to wage war against our soul. The way we do that is we abstain. And so these, all of these practices um, help us to abs learn to abstain from uh, things that we're involved in or, or temptations that we're involved in. And so what you're going to get here is you're going to get in your notes, you should be able to read all of these in your notes the same as they are on the screen. So if you want to look at that instead of the screen, that's fine. Um, and I can share the reading around uh, if we want to. Uh, um, I, I think that's always a good idea. So I don't know who, uh, maybe I can go on my list. I've got Dare, then Pat, then Lydia, then Michelle. So maybe in that order, if you want to read, if you don't just pass, you know, you can just say, no, thank you. But if you want to read, then that'll, they'll change it up from my voice. <laughs> so again, I don't want to talk the whole time if it's, if not. So if we can, um, Dare, maybe you could read this one on solitude for me, if you're willing, just a little description of it, if you could. Yes. In solitude, we purposely abstain from interaction with other human beings, denying ourselves companionship and all that comes from our conscious interaction with others. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and for us one, extreme introverts, that's no problem. <laughs> exactly. If your personality is you're a people person and most people are saying, well, where are we going? And you're saying, who's going to be there, right? You're, you're just worried about the people because you get life and energy from people. This one is a challenge. I think a lot of extroverts think that this one would be too hard to do. And you can be a little antsy and things whenever you do it, but um, rest assured it, it can, it can work out. You know, it, it can work out. You can do it as you're able to, not as uh, you know, a great monk may do it differently than you, but you can do it. Um, but basically, I want to read a little bit more from a page I have here that talks about this. Um, the reason that we refrain from interacting with other people for a time is just to be alone with God and to be found by Him. So I think it's powerful to see that when you're in solitude, you can be found by God in a different way. And it is exhilarating when God finds you. Um, I think, I don't remember if I shared this last week, but I was sitting in a room of 500 people at a Bible study one time. This was at a youth workers convention. So, you know, it was in a different city and uh, there were, you know, several thousand people there. So in this one Bible study, there were 500 people or so. I was sitting on the end. I'll never forget where I was sitting. And I, I had an experience where Jesus found me. Like it was like, um, I was just sitting there, you know, enjoying the Bible study. And it almost like for the first time in my life, I had a personal understanding that Jesus was real and he was right with me. And that was cool. It's like, he found me, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I, I mean, I was looking for him, but I didn't realize he could be so close. I didn't realize he could do that. So when you choose solitude, you're basically saying, Jesus, I want, God, I want to be alone with you and I want to be found by you. I want you to discover me and something about me. And, and, and so while you could be going, getting around people 
and they're finding you and and they're enjoying you, this is kind of a special time for you to say, I want, I want you to find me, God. So if you can see it that way, if you're a real people person, this this might be something God's inviting you to try. And I just want to make sure you know that that's the, the goal. We have many scriptures on this that Jesus, I can give this scripture list to you as well. I should have already done that. I apologize. I I did not. I'll try to forward that uh, maybe tomorrow morning uh, with all the scriptures to these passages. I've got a really good piece of, I really got a really good document that shows all the scriptures. Um, but Jesus often went by himself to, to solitude. So let me ask you this. If you're practicing solitude, what are some, what, if you're, if you're not one who likes to just sit still, calm yourself, if you're not an introvert, or even if you are, what are some things you could do during solitude that wouldn't break your time with God of being alone? What are some, some different things you could do uh, while you practice solitude? Can anybody think of anything? I argue with him. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. What could you do? Could you do anything actively, but still maintain solitude? Oh, I walk outdoors. Wonderful. Walking is a great way to practice solitude uh, because, you know, you're, you're, you're engaging your body with it, right? Uh, you're, you're keeping your chest up and your, you know, your posture back, you're keeping your breathing going good. You know, you're, looking around at other things that may or may not distract you. But usually if you're walking in creation, that, that kind of helps you to focus on God. So walking is a great way to practice solitude. If you don't want to sit in a chair, for instance, I like to go out in my front yard right now in Indiana, it's fall, right? We have 70 degrees, 60 degrees. You know, you can sit out there and not move in the stillness of solitude. And it's beautiful because the weather is so good. Uh, but if it's hot, you know, you don't want to do that. If it's really hot, maybe you don't like that. But what could you do? Where could you go? Could you go somewhere in the city if you're in Houston? Or could you, is there a, a college campus you could go and there's this little cove inside, you know, you could find some some solitude uh, away from people. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things you can do to practice it. Um, another idea is, is just taking a bike ride, you know. Um, that's a way to practice solitude, but you're still moving. You're still engaging your body in some way a little bit differently. But all this is, is again, it's about God kind of finding you or discovering you. You're, you get a chance to have his full attention. He's already got his attention on you, but you may not be aware of it while you're busy with people. So if you're away from people, you can actually see how much he wants to focus on you, how much he wants to impart something to you, how much he wants to share with you um, because he loves you. So think of solitude as God investing in you, God wants to find you when it's just you. And he can tell you some things that you can't hear when you're around other people. And that's a good way to see it. So perhaps this is one of the ones you want to try to practice this week. Um, the next one I have here is fasting. And uh, fasting, I will ask Pat, I don't know if you're willing, um, if you could to read that one for me. Yes. In fasting... We abstain in some significant way from food. This discipline reveals how much our peace depends on the pleasures of eating or how our bodies and soul are using food. Fasting confirms our utter dependency on God by finding in him a source of substance, and, substance and beyond food. Yes. So this one's a challenge. I know it, it's more difficult. So this may or may not be one you want to try during this period of time. But again, if God is inviting you to it, it doesn't have to be an all day fast. It doesn't have to be a fast from everything, uh, but, but you can practice it as you're able. So I don't want this one to scare you just because a lot of people need, need to eat. They've got health issues or whatever. And I understand that. Um, and you can also abst abstain even from other things besides food. But I think the primary idea in fasting is that God feeds you beyond food sometimes. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And I don't know if Jesus was hungry, uh, you know, in the wilderness, at, you know, but it, it kind of indicates that after he had fasted 40 days, 
the devil came and tempted him to turn bread into uh, rock into bread. And it, it almost sounds like as you read it that for 40 days, he was feasting on God and the word of God in the Old Testament. And then at the time that he became hungry, that's when Satan saw his door. But I would almost I would almost venture to say in fasting, sometimes somehow as you pray and you put your attention on God, he somehow has food or manna that you cannot see. And this uh, giving up of food is a really uh, a really strong way to say, you know, God, I, I would like to have you sustain me with spiritual food for a while while I seek you. Um, because I really, I really want to know you better. I really want to be freed from some of the temptations in my life. Because again, abstinence, as we read in first Peter is abstinence is the way to overcome some of these temptations. And I'll just say this from my own personal experience. I'll be completely um, honest with you. I think eating and fasting is sometimes tied to sexual temptation, um, lust and things like that. So what I found is in fasting, it, it kind of breaks that stronghold, you know, that uh, uh, mental desire to, you know, to kind of pursue that. And so I'm not sure if it would be that way for you, but I can say that it, it does have that effect in my life. And so a habit of fasting for me is really important. I don't fast all the time, not even every week, but I found that a continued use of this one will help me to say no to ungodliness. So, so again, you know, maybe you could do like a certain kind of food you're fasting from, or maybe one meal, you know, uh, but it does have power. Uh, and again, you're not doing it to fix all your problems, but you're doing it to know God better. But I will say this, it does have an impact. Okay, Pat, I see your hand is raised. Would you like to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, right now, uh, like you say, do a try to do a practice of fasting. I'm going through, I'm doing a fast right now, but what I'm fasting is TV. I, <laughs> I always, you know, because I found myself, you know, I spend more time watching the TV when I'm not working and I should be, you know, studying or reading the Bible or, you know, the time that could be used with God, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, you know, I decided that, you know, this month that I would be fasting the TV. So I haven't watched TV as of any, any of September. So I'm just trusting that God has something great for me. And I always try to do something different each month because I don't want to get, you know, stagnant. I want to, you know, keep it fresh. So I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in fasting. I appreciate that. What do you find in what way does it help you um, either with temptation or, or how does it help you see God better or more clearly? Is there, would you be willing to share that with us? Yes, because if I'm, if I'm spending the time that I normally would spend watching TV, watching all the commercials and all the things that they have on the tube, I call it the one eye monster. That mm -hmm. you know, and like you say, it is a lot of perversion on there. And you can get caught up watching that kind of stuff. And then it leads to, you know, the mind going one way and it should be, you know, going the other way. So I find myself now, you know, spending more time in the word and soaking up the knowledge of God instead of, you know, letting my mind wonder on what's going on out there in the world or what I could be doing other than, you know, spending the time with God. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I almost see fasting from media or TV also as partially a practice of solitude because it it's kind of getting rid of a noise that, that keeps you thinking about something and it allows that solitude to take place where you're reading God's word or spending that time with him noticing you and you noticing him. So I would say, um, I've, I've, uh, also done the same thing, but as I think about it tonight, I would say it is a, an act of fasting, but it's also maybe an act of solitude in some ways. So that would be interesting to think about, but thank you for sharing with us on that. 
Um, I'm going to move to frugality just because I don't want to miss a chance to get through all these tonight. So I have Lydia, would you, are you willing to read that one for me, frugality? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Uh, in frugality, we abstain from using money or goods at our disposal in ways that merely gratify our desires or our hunger for status, glamour, or luxury. Practicing frugality means we stay within the bounds of what general good judgment would designate us as necessarily for the kind of life to which God has led us. Perfect. Thank you. So we're, we're just another term for this one is simplicity. I didn't, I didn't put it there, but you know, people say simplicity is a discipline of the spiritual life that you're only doing really what you need. You're not excess on stuff. You're not buying a bunch of extra stuff that you have to take care of and keep up with and maintain. You keep your schedule simple and quiet. You keep your stuff simple and quiet. And it just allows you to uh, not get set in those gratifications and desires for status or the way you look. Or And so frugality is in America probably a pretty good one to practice because we are in such a wealthy country and we have so many distractions. But uh, frugality basically is abstaining from some of those things. And I think probably everybody um, understands that one. It's kind of detachment, really, from possessions. Um, you're not going to take it with you anyway. If you can learn to live simply, um, when you do find your inheritance in heaven, you know, you're not going to be missing anything anyway. So kind of a detachment and it limits your, limits your distractions. So that's frugality. Um Let's do three more of abstinence disciplines. Um, the next one is chastity. Um, I've got Michelle next. Michelle, are you willing to read chastity, the paragraph? Yes, I can. Chastity. Chastity. In chastity, we purposefully turn away from dwelling upon or engaging in the sexual dimension of our relationship to others. Even our husbands and wives. Sexuality is one of the most powerful and subtle forces in human nature, and the human suffering tied directly to it is horrifying. Chastity is not just abstaining from sex, but also from indulging in sexual feelings and thoughts, just learning how not to be governed by them. Yes, thank you so much. In chastity, which we don't think of much, um, it's really about just not using other people for my gratification. And you're supposed to, in a husband-wife marriage relationship, be able to do that. But this is saying there are there may be times when um, it will be good to practice not using another person to gratify you. And so this can help you find freedom from being dominated by um, by these things. And it can train your eyes and your imagination to see God's children as sons and daughters and brothers and sisters to be respected. So, you know, this is, um, this is a uh, one that again is so prolific in our culture with pornography and these devices that we have that chastity may be one that could be a growing practice for our culture and for, you know, for Christians. Um, and so it's a good one to consider. It's just not one that we talk about a lot. There are, you know, vows of celibacy, uh, things like that, uh, that people take when they're in certain uh, ministry roles and things like that. Um, we find a lot of scandal in those and a lot of failure there too. But this is something that's, you're not, you know, it's not something that you will practice for and definitely, it's really just a a way to turn your heart toward God and to see others as his children, his beloved, and not see them for, uh, you know, using for your own pleasure or gain. And so chastity is a good one to think about if that's something that uh, that you, that God is inviting you to try. Again, if he's not inviting you, I wouldn't try it just to see what it is. I would, I would only do it if he's inviting you to do it because he knows what things you need right now. Um, to to grow in grace. 
So the next one is secrecy. I see Carlos here now with us. Welcome, Carlos. Would you read that paragraph on secrecy for me? Yes, sir. <clears throat> secrecy. In secrecy, we uh, we abstain, abstain from causing our good deeds and qualities to be known. In the practice of secrecy, we experience a continuing relationship with God, independent of the opinions of others. Thank you. It's a really, really good one for if you're kind of looking for, if you're one who tends to look for praise or um, to be highlighted. And that's sometimes a personality trait, you know, that we, that some people have. But this is a way to say, you know what, I want to be dependent on God alone, not the opinions of others. And so this one can be good for us to find our sufficiency only in God. When you do something in secret, no one else knows. It's just you and God and you get the joy of it. That's secrecy is a cool one. If you want to experience joy, I think, honestly, because when you do something in secret and you and God know about it, but the other person doesn't, it's kind of fun. You kind of get excited about that with God. Uh, because you and God know that the blessing's going forward and the other person's going to receive a blessing, but they don't know where it's com coming from. So this is kind of a fun one to to do. Um, and so if you're one who tends to be in the limelight a lot, or maybe just your job has you always in front of the papers or, you know, the TV and you just get tired of that limelight or, or whatever, you're on, on uh, social media a lot, this would be a good one to, to see if God's inviting you into practice or try. And then the last one on the disciplines of abstinence that we have is called sacrifice. I'll be back, go back up to Dare for this one, um, if you could. In sacrifice, we abstain from the possession or enjoyment of what is necessary for our living, not as in frugality, which is what is superfluous. In sacrifice, we forsake the security of meeting our own needs and what is in our hands. It is a total abandonment to God. <clears throat> Definitely. This one is where you're giving up your provision, trusting that God's going to give it back to you if you give it to someone else. Um, and that doesn't have to be a, like food or anything. It can be. Uh, it can be an act of agape love where you're giving someone a place to stay and you, you know, uh, or uh, I mean, it can be many, many hundreds of things. I, I'm not prepared to give a lot of examples, but I think you get the idea that this is where the very thing that you might need to have to, to make it, you just give it to someone else, the shirt off your back, for instance, or um, you all may have some good examples uh, in your own lives of this practice, but could be that God, you know, if you, if you tend toward having to see everything and make sure that everything's there and every detail and you worry about every detail, this could be one that God may be inviting you to try so that you can see just how good he is. I um, mean, again, you know, it's not something you would do foolishly unless God's inviting you to do it. You don't want to practice it because then you could just be doing something foolish with the resources you have. But if he invites you to try it, he'll show you what it is. He'll give you a person that needs needs the, the thing that you have, um, or he'll instruct you in what to watch for. So um, so definitely this is one that you can practice. But again, unless God invites you to, I would not recommend that you try it. Because again, this is all about God being the hero. It's not about us doing it, uh, being good at it, you know, using it for self-righteousness. These are not ways to use these. It's only if God invites you to do it. And as you're able, um, it, the amount of sacrifice is between you and God. And, and so as you're able practice these things. And so these are ones where you might give up something, abstain from something. Um, and that in that way, it gives you more dependence on God. Now, what we're going to look at is are the ones called, and this is on your page as well, disciplines of engagement. So at the top of your at the top of your table, your chart, you should have a blank there and you can fill it in. The first blank was disciplines of abstinence. Now on the on the back side, it's disciplines of engagement. 
So let's look at these for uh, just a, a couple of minutes. Study is the is the next one. And this is a you're going to this is where maybe you tend to be too busy with other things and you really need to engage with God or you're you're too hidden uh, or you're you're too introverted, maybe, or you're uh, you know, uh, you, you shy away from doing something that you don't know how to do that much, but God wants to teach you. So he wants you to engage. And so um, let me read from Mark real quick. So these are things like if you if you have the sin of omission, like you you know the good you ought to do, but you don't do it. It is sin for you. That's a sin of omission, right? Um, so if you know something's good to do, like study, but you don't do it, it might be sin for you. And so God may be saying, I'm going to call you into a discipline of engagement so that you can grow and not omit something that would be very good for you to do. And so if these are kind of the O up there at the top is for, uh, stands for omission. So uh, it kind of helps you get past or break through in grace, uh, past the sins of omission. I'm going to read Mark 2.11 and see what it says. I can't remember. <laughs> um. 10 says, I want, Jesus is saying, I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and walk. That surely can't be right. So I've got the wrong scripture here, I think. No, he did. He did. I think maybe take up your mat and walk. Um, is what he needed to do there. So I'll have to check that back. But anyway, sin, disciplines of engagement of doing something. You may have normally left it alone, but God's calling you to step into it. And so here we go. Study uh, is the first one. Um, I believe we have Pat next. Uh, let's ask Pat to read that one. Study. In study, we engage ourselves with the written and spoken word of God in the Bible. Though, though not a scholarly pursuit in study we sometimes with the aid of a teacher read hear inquire and meditate on the word of god very good so study is saying i'm going to trust the holy spirit in the words of scripture um to guide me in wisdom and strength for life i'm literally going to see the bible as living and active I'm, I know that I need it. I know that it's going to show me something to move toward God, and I'm going to inter interact with it, even if I don't, even if I'm a little afraid of it, I don't understand it, or there's too much of it. I'm going to get some help from a teacher. I'm going to do whatever it takes, but I'm going to know that this living and active word um, is going to bring a measure of knowledge to me, a measure of grace, a measure of understanding and wisdom. And I'm going to engage with study. Uh, personally, uh, I've gotten a lot better at study over the years, but you know, when I went to South Houston Bible Institute, I had to do all of the work that B. Shelburne was giving me. And so he gave us lots of scriptures and we did a lot of study. Um, but in, when I was in, in youth ministry or youth pastoring, you know, I tended to, I, I, you know, I tended to not have a good habit of study during those years uh, for at least a while. And so it was, this wasn't a discipline that I did very well. Um, only, you know, obviously since going into the teaching role at a church, the pastoral role, the minister's role. Um, I've certainly come to love it, but, um, but you know, it's, it, it, you got to really be willing to sit down and engage. Um, once you do, obviously it's a ma major powerful thing, but if you're not given to settling down, which I'm not always a settled person, to be honest, um, you know, it, it's kind of a tricky one. So maybe God's inviting you to settle in because he's got something for you that will change you radically for the rest of your life. And he wants to show you what it is. And it's only going to come through study. So that's a good one. Um, Lydia, can you read worship? Yes. And worship through the use of thought, words, practices, and symbols we engage ourselves with, dwell upon, fill our hearts and minds with, and express the greatness, beauty, and goodness of God. Amazing. Excellent. Worship. I, this one, because our bodies are living sacrifices and our, and that's our spiritual act of worship, this one, you know, kind of puts worship into, you know, singing and thought and words, but I think it's, it's a pretty good definition here just because it doesn't stop with singing. Um, 
you can obviously put on praise music and worship music. Obviously, that's a good way to do it. But I like here that that this description shows you're also engaging your thinking in worship about who God is, his magnificence. You're using words to say his magnificence. You may be reading an old prayer. You may be reading a psalm. Um, you're using practices like we did the very first week. You know, where did you, wh what was, uh, where did you feel closest to God and where did you feel farthest away? These are practices that help us worship God. And also symbols. You may, you may take some artwork or something or, you know, be out in nature and see, you know, a, a bird or something and look at that thing and it helps you engage with and dwell upon and fill your heart with, with greatness, beauty, and the goodness of God. I mean, so worship is, is a really broad thing. And I like this one. So if this is one that God's inviting you into, I will just say this, there are many facets to worship. And so this one's a deep one, a wide one, a broad one. And, uh, and so if that's the one you want to put on your calendar for this week, uh, and you need some help, then reach out. I'll try to give you some things that you can look at to use, to engage all those things, thoughts, words, practices, symbols, um, and your body to engage in worship. Um, I think, um, Michelle, can you read the celebration piece for us there? Yes, I can. In celebration, we notice and honor God's goodness to us. We enjoy ourselves, delight in our lives and our world as God's work and God's gift to us. This can include community festivity and feasting. Uh, feasts of various kinds. Yeah. So this is, uh, I would say for myself, the most challenging one. And I was taught as a kid, you know, that celebration was, you know, usually not allowed <laughs> for different reasons. I'm not going to go into it, but, um, and in my life right now, this is the one God's inviting me into. So I will just tell you now, when we get to the end here and we pick we pick a, uh, a discipline or a practice to do. This is going to be my, the one I'm going to choose. Um, maybe that you're not good at this either. You're always serving others or you just feel like you can't enjoy because you've got too many things that you're worried about. So celebration might be a good practice for us. Um, we're going to keep moving a little quicker. I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to let Carlos read service and then I'm going to take the rest of them just for time's sake. Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay. Service. In service, we engage our goods and strength in the active promotion of the good of others and the causes of God in our world. Serving others can also train us away from arrogance, positivity, positive, positive, possessiveness, That's possessive. yeah. envy, resentment, and our Covalence. Covetousness. 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 Where we Covetous. kind of covet what other people have. Yeah. Covetousness. Yeah. yeah. Those are big words, but good. You did a good job. Um, so service is really promoting the good of other people. And when you're thinking about other people and you're really promoting their good in a genuine way, not in a fake way, or uh, I gotta do this. But if you're really serving people, this is this has the power to break a lot of things in your life and the, the list there at the bottom, it can break envy and it can break resentment. If you're serving someone that, you know, maybe did something um, and you serve them with, with the right attitude and a whole heart, it can break that resentment down. You know, it can, it can really do a lot. So service is engaging in uh, the good of others. It's humbly serving God. Basically uh, you're not just serving the person you're serving God by giving his love and compassion to people. Next one is prayer. We're all familiar with this one. We carry an ongoing conversational relationship with God. We talk to God aloud or within our thoughts. Prayer is often done in a combination with one or more of the others. So as you're serving, you can pray. As you're studying, you'll pray. You know, as you're worshiping, you'll pray. So prayer really goes, prayer is the one that just goes everywhere with all of them. And so this one will always be participating in hopefully all the time, but it's conversing with God. And you want to talk to God about what you're doing together. So if you're serving God, we're serving today. What do, help me know how to serve better? What can I do? You're always always seeking Him to to lead and direct you with prayer. Prayer is a great conversation with God, doing things together with God. Um, the last couple are confession. 
In confession, we lay down the burden of hiding and pretending, and we let trusted others know our deep weaknesses and failures. But in turn, we receive forgiveness from God and freedom from and healing from the psychological and physical harm that hiding does to our hearts, our souls, and our bodies. And if you're one who's hidden things in your life, you know this can eat at the insides of you. It can can literally deplete you. You can you can literally hold things in that make you ill. But confession breaks the power of that, and it allows you to know God better because you receive his freedom. You start to gain some healing in your mind and body and soul. So uh, the last one is submission. Submission is when we follow the way of Jesus, the way he taught concerning mutual submission with people, and submission through the practice of not being in control. We learn the highest levels of fellowship involving humility, complete honesty, transparency and trust and uh, submission is not one that probably many people would know about or would have you know thought was a discipline and you can also see this as a discipline of abstinence too you're abstaining from taking the lead or but i think it's a i put it in engagement because it's you're engaging uh, god with this you're submitting to him so you're you're submitting to a person which means you're engaging with submission to god but you're also uh, also abstaining in some ways as well. So this one could go in either category. And then a few others that I didn't list that are not in the main ones. Like if you look these up online or you go to the to the people that talk about the renovation of the heart, like Dallas Willard and Richard Foster and others, they these are the ones that are most commonly known in the Christian circles. But there are some others that could be, uh, you know, disciplines. And these may not be all engagement. I just put them here at the end. So I don't know which categories they necessarily fit in, but you may want to give these a look as well. And I don't think they're on your, yeah, they are on your chart. So you, you can have them there in front of you. But these may be ones God's inviting you into giving or generosity, journaling, stewardship, Sabbath, gratitude, meditation, spiritual reading, which is basically an old practice called Lexio Divina, where you read the scripture three or four times and you ask, what stands out to me? What might God be saying to me? But it's called spiritual reading as well. And then retreat. Maybe you need a retreat, which is also solitude, maybe worship, maybe a whole bunch of things in one, but it's a, a more extended time to get away from, not just in a room away for a couple of hours, but maybe you get away from everything, your job for a while, your family for a day or two and things like that. And then vigils, which include not sleeping, you're staying up and tearing over something. So those are some that may fit as well. Uh, but what I'm interested in is maybe you picking one of the main ones for this time to uh, practice this week. So I'm going to go about five more minutes, and then I'm going to have you kind of look over these. And before we before we leave today, I want you to uh, try to tell me which one do you think God may be inviting you into. Um, and then I would like for you to say, and here's a space in my calendar when I know I can at least try to practice this. Um, again, I'm not going to hold you to the fire per se, but I want you to say it because then you're being more intentional about it before you leave class. Uh, and then I might follow up privately with you all, the ones here on the call and say, what did you pick again? I'm going to record it. Um, when did you decide to try it? What are you going to try to do? And then next week we'll share into the group. And this is, um, this is important for me that you do this. This is only the last six weeks that we're going to be doing this. So I would really appreciate your participation. Even if you fail or you don't do it well, that's okay. Because again, this is all about you and God. It's not, you're not trying to check a box or get a, get a badge. You're not trying to be a hero. You're just trying to see what God wants to do in your life to upend some of the, the powers that are pulling you down so that you can be free to serve the living God. So we don't want to make this anything but that, you know, it's, it's for you and you alone. I'm only having you share because that's how transformation happens. Transformation, you 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 have information come in, then you practice it, which is what we're going to do, and then you reflect on it, and then you share it. That process there, when you share it, that's the last piece of transformation. You, you're able to talk about what you did, and you bring it into the community, and that somehow that moves your soul, your heart, your spirit, your mind toward transformation. So that's why I'm having you do it, not, for, not because I need to know. Um, even if you practice secrecy, you know, you may not want to share it, but you can say, this is what I practice. Here's what I gained from it. Um, or you may say, you know what? I don't want to talk about it, but I would just 
really ask you to open your life up for the next six weeks on these and and just share honestly i didn't do it this week or and so i'll encourage you well let's pick it up and and see if god's still inviting you to it this week and we'll just keep trying but we want to have success through through uh, cheering each other on so um i had some further guidance i'm not going to read that because it's we are almost out of time um but here's what i do want to say to you um if you think about what God may be inviting you to, just, just, just ask these questions. What kind of stood out to you recently or this week? I know we're in a midweek, so it may not have, you may say, well, nothing this week, but in the last week or two weeks, what do you think God may be saying to you? You know, if there's a place in your life where there's a struggle or you're distracted or you've got an obstacle, um, or you, you just keep noticing this pattern of, here's when I feel farthest away from God, or um, here's a temptation I keep struggling with, or what might God be inviting you into that would help you live the with God life, that would help you live under the yoke of of Jesus? What what might he he be inviting you into that could break that chain or that could upend, upend what you're doing so that you have a chance to see it clearly? Do you sense an invitation or an action that God is inviting you to experiment with. These are really powerful and important questions when it comes to practicing the spiritual disciplines. So I just want you to take a moment and think about that. I'm going to just be quiet for a minute. Think about these questions. I'm going to give us two minutes. And then after two minutes, I'm going to um, invite us back to the page and we're going to start to look over uh, which one we might want to choose. So just take two minutes privately, mute yourself, ask these questions. Don't worry about anybody else right now. Just try to see if God will help you understand what he might be inviting you to. Steady. And then if you would, when you're ready, look over your homework page, or I can go back through, scroll back through these. And uh, just see if there's one that the Holy Spirit might be, even if you don't know why, maybe one of these, solitude, which is purposefully be alone with God, so he'll notice you, and fasting would be to find food that's not, you know, that you're, you're sustained by the very, you know, presence of God, or you cut out something that you tend to feed on too much, whether that be media or food, frugality, just being simple, getting rid of some things, decluttering, maybe, um, chastity to just see people for their value and not to, um, not for your pleasure per se secrecy of just doing this and where no one knows except you and God you're keeping quiet about it no no words to anyone else sacrifice is literally something you may actually need but someone else needs it and you're going to trust God to provide it even if you give it away could be any form of money or food or shelter or just a blessing um, um, study just you might need to engage you might need to 
come out of your hiding and engage with God through study or worship. Uh, just put together some times where you're really reflecting with your body, your mind. Uh, celebration, maybe you need to spend some time in praise and thanksgiving and feasting and cheers and getting around people and and just remembering and having a good time or service where you put the needs of others, you're, you're for their strength. Prayer, carrying on a conversation with God more frequently. Fellowship. I don't think we read fellowship. I might have skipped it, but this is where you get with the larger body. But one of the things I like about it is you you engage in um, common activities with others, but maybe even you, you talk about God there in fellowship. You you share a testimony or something. Fellowship is much richer when it's a spiritually focused thing. Confession, um, laying down burdens and finding healing and then submission would be kind of the last one there. So we're right at the time, but I'm going to hold us just a couple minutes over just because I want to give you a chance. If you're willing, um, you don't have to say anything more than this is the one that's standing out to me. Um, and if you have a calendar, if you, if you have a time in your calendar, you know, you want to practice it. Maybe it's something you practice every day, but if as much as you can tell me, if it's just the practice, just tell me the practice. If it's the practice plus maybe, how you're thinking about doing it. If you have that much already, if you don't, if you don't need to go work on it, you can do that. I'll follow up with you privately, but just uh, let's just go through. Does anybody want to share which one you think you'll try and uh, a little bit about it before we close? Yes. Study. Carlos. Yes. I want to try get better into study. The studying part. Study. Okay. Yes, I need, cause I get, I really have a hard time with studying. I can say sometimes I get, Distracted very easily sometimes, but study has been it's it's something that he's been calling me to do because honestly, I got this little prayer line and prayer line and you know, and it encourages they encourage us to like like sometimes I bring the word, like bring the word, encouraging word on there. And uh -huh. and I have to do I want to study to get right when I'm when I'm putting out there, you know what I mean? And from for God to put on my mind to put out there, you know what I mean. So studying is, is really one that I, I struggle with. So if you can look at your week this week, and I know I know when you put it on the calendar, something's going to try to upend it, right? You're gonna something's going to try to get in the way, but try to find the time that you can hold and stand firm on. And and if you need help picking something, you probably got people around you that can help you. Or um, if you need me though. Just reach out. I'll, I'll I'll give you a call or something like that. So thank you for sharing. Yes, sir. I'll put it down. I'll stay. I got it. You're welcome. I think, Michelle, uh, would you like to... Did your hand go up? Yeah, it was up. Um, for me, submission. Submission. Okay. What I wanted to know, though, is um, this is going to be an ongoing thing as the submission, because I'm thinking, mm, not like I can carve out any time to do this. How do I do this? Well, I'll tell you what, without, um, if, if you're available uh, either right after this, session or tomorrow i can just call and talk to you about what that might look like um, because i have to maybe hear a little bit more it does sound like something though that you'll be doing ongoing it may not be something you carve out time for but how will you start like tomorrow how will you begin the practice and so i think that'd be more important question to ask um okay. than trying to set aside a calendar time but uh, would you prefer i give you a call after the tonight or maybe tomorrow morning sometime you can call me. Um, call me after tonight. Cause okay. I'll be. I will do. I will reach out to you. Uh, here in a little while. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Lydia. Um, I think for me it's going to be solid too, because it's really hard for me to be like with by myself for a long time, just because I'm more of an extrovert. Um. Well, I'm kind of in the middle between an extrovert and an introvert, but for me, uh, that's definitely something that I probably need to be doing. 
Okay. And again, do as you can, not as you can't. So don't, you know, don't overshoot with, I got to do five hours, maybe just 30 minutes or, and see how that goes. And then if you can carve out another longer time, if it goes well, uh, just make sure that you're not um, setting yourself up for failure. Just do as you can. If it's not something you're used to, um, just um, make sure that you're, but you can put that in your calendar and that would probably be a smart thing to do uh, for this particular practice. So thank you. Anybody else? I've got Pat and Dare. Either one of you want to share tonight before we go? Uh, confession. Uh, I'll be in solitude uh, sometime tomorrow to start this. Uh, uh, beginning a reassessment of where I am, what I think, what I feel what I need to do uh, in this whole area. So okay. I've got to look at a little more honestly where I really am. If you have someone to go to, feel free. If you need me, just let me know and I can spend some time with you. So we'll do. Okay. Pat, do you have something to share tonight? Oh, I chose, I'm going to do the the prayer. Okay. I'll just spend more time in prayer, earnestly prayer. Wonderful. And I'm going to do celebration. I've got um, to pick, I'm, I'm going to try to do it every day. Um, every night before I go to bed, I'm going to try to gather the family as much as possible. They're scattered, but um, <laughs> and if it's just me, I'm going to do something to verbally and bodily uh, celebrate uh, something that God's that I'm thankful to God for. So I will let you know next week how that goes. So we will start next week sharing into this a little bit about this before we go through new material. So prepare to share. And again, if you don't do it, prepare to say I didn't do it. Um, and that's OK, because what we want to do again is the process of transformation is we even share when we don't do it so that. We get that out of the way. We don't hold it or hide it. We get it out of the way and then we can move forward again the next week. That's how that's how transformation works. So I really appreciate every one of you. You're so kind and so good. And thank you for being here and participating and giving yourselves over. I'm going to be praying for you really a lot this week, just really praying for you. And I want to pray that you'll see God in a way, have an, an encounter with God in a way that you say, this was so rich and so needed and so good that it will just continue to give you energy and enthusiasm as we move forward into uh, more of these. So I'm going to say God bless you at this point and uh, let you go. And thank you again for everything. We'll see you. Uh, see you next week. Do you have, do you have something to say? Uh, don't have too much fun partying now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know next week. So. <laughs> Good night, everyone. God bless you. Right. Peace. Good night. Thank you. Uh-huh.